Okay, dear colleagues and friends, uh, welcome to the first AMCA Toronto online lecture. I hope that you are all doing well and that in the near future, we will be able to attend events like this in person. Uh, this time, the questions may be submitted in a written form through the chat at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I should say a few words in Croatian uh, before we go proceed with the lecture. Dobar dan, ova godina je bila teška iz više razloga, tako da su aktivnosti AMKE značajno opale. Zbog nemogućnosti organizirati događanja uživo, odlučili smo se za online prezentacije talentiranih govornika. Kako je zbog pandemije otpao Božić domjenak, pokušat ćemo organizirati večer online, gdje bismo mogli čakulati svako iz svog doma u zajedničku glazbu, zalogaj i kapljicu. Ako ste zainteresirani, in two weeks on Saturday, December 12, our online guest speaker will be a renowned Croatian physicist and outspoken and captivating speaker, Davor Pavuna. Now about tonight's uh, or today's speech. America's presidential elections, which were followed by the whole world, are behind us. On election night, when it became obvious that Trump was winning in Florida and Ohio, while also doing well at the time, in the Midwest and Pennsylvania, many started having flashbacks to 2016. Could this happen again? Have the pollsters again made such a huge blunder? Why is there no green wave? One company remained calm. Our guest speaker tonight or today, Dr. Vuk Vukovic is a co-founder and CEO of Oracle Intelligence Systems LTD a UK-based data company that uses the power of social networks, big data, and machine learning to predict elections outcomes, market movements, product demand, and consumer behavior. Their work includes doing survey experiments, data science modeling, and complex network survey, which uh, they have done in 15 countries worldwide. Please, please, hello, please. Yeah. Okay. All done using social media. They have successfully predicted Brexit and Trump in 2016 and Biden's victory in 2020. In all cases with margins of error with a single percentage, within a single percentage point. Vuk holds a PhD in political economy from the University of Oxford a Master of Science in Political Economy from the uh, London School of Economics and a BA in Economics from the University of Zagreb. He's cur currently turning his PhD thesis into a book. During his studies, he attended summer schools at the University of California in Berkeley and Harvard University and was a visiting scholar at the University of uh, Cambridge uh, during the summer of 2013. On the other hand, he's happily married and a father of two boys. Dear colleagues and friends, it is my honor to welcome to AMCA Toronto Lecture Series, Vuk Vukovic. Gospodine Vukovic, is all it is. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, kind of introduction. Saves me the time for introducing myself. Um, so we can basically go on to, to, the, to the presentation immediately. Again, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking with you all tonight. Uh, well, it's tonight for me, and it's it's still uh, day daytime for you. Uh, so yeah, let's let's get down to it. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen, and I'll talk a little bit about the prediction models that we did that we did for this current election, um, the, the the Biden Trump election, and I'll talk a little bit about how our methodology works in general, just so you can get an idea of uh, of what this is and what it looks like and how it works. Okay, um, so. Okay, first question is can you can you see the can you see the screen? Yeah, I can. Yeah, okay. I'm sure cool. the other one. All right, perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, this is basically um, uh, the company. So yeah, Klesha already uh, introduced me. So I'll just go on um, with the whole with the whole idea. So we're Oracle, we're a data science company, successfully predicted, as you might have heard, uh, uh, Brexit, Trump, and Biden within a single percentage point of accuracy. Um, and the way we're doing this is we're using a, a sort of a different way of, of doing polling. We're, we're using something we call the Bayesian Adjusted Social Network Survey. I'll explain to you what this is. But just a background story, 
Um, so the whole thing, thing started with three of us. Um, all three were, in, were, in, were scientists. Uh, one of my colleagues is a physicist. He was a professor of physics in Zagreb. And the other was a professor of computer science. And I was teaching economics back at the time in, in, in the Zagreb School of Economics. Uh, this was before I went to Oxford. Um, so we, uh, we, kind of, we, we wanted to do, write a new methodology, uh, write a paper about a new methodology of using uh, of polls in a better way of making predictions more accurately by removing biases from people's uh, uh, predictions and people's responses in general. Uh, and we were testing this on students, uh, students at the University of Zagreb at FER, at the Faculty of Engineering. Um, and we, we, we were asking students to predict their test scores. Right, so, so what are you, you going to get on your test score and what are your friends going to get? And the accuracy at which they were predicting was incredible. Um, and then we started testing in elections. And the first elections we did, it was the Croatian 2015 election. And again, the precision was amazing. And then we did Brexit in 2016 and Trump. And, and we got incredible results. And then, you know, we decided it's time to uh, start a company. So we never based to commercialize this whole methodology. And we never wrote the paper that we wanted to write in the, in the first place. But instead of it, we, uh, uh, we started the company. And now we're doing this commercially. So yeah, um, what, what I say here, so our big secret is that we use network analysis. I'll explain uh, uh, exactly how we do this. Um, just briefly, so the way that this usually works is that we do all our polling via social media. So uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Um, so we, get, we ask users to, um, to log in. They log into one of our apps. And then we basically try to find um, and friendship links between them. I'll explain to you how this works in, in greater detail. We ask them certain questions about their attitudes and then we get the prediction and we deliver the, the report. So our methodology that I mentioned, it's called the Bayesian survey. Uh, and this is what it basically looks like, right? So there, there's two parts of it, there's two steps. The first one is the wisdom of crowds concept where we ask our participants, so people that come into our survey, our users, we ask them three basic questions, right? First is to express a preference. So for example, usually it's for a product or a service or an opinion on a certain issue, or in this case of an election, who you're gonna vote for. And then we ask them, what do you think about how other people are gonna vote for? So who do they, what do you think they will do essentially? And what do you think how they would answer the previous questions? Now, this may sound convoluted initially and it's deliberately so, right? So we, we, we're, we're asking questions this way because we wanna force people to really think about it. Because there's this, there's this thing in behavioral psychology where you know when you go with your gut instinct, it's one thing, but when you take five, 10, 30 seconds to think about an issue, you start thinking in from a different perspective. And we're noticing that people tend to self-correct themselves, well, self-correct when, when, when they're answering questions. So this is what it basically looks like, this first part, right? So users log in via, to our app, via Facebook or Twitter, uh, and then this is the type of questions, this was for the 2016 election. So what percentage of the population of your state, in this case, Pennsylvania, for example, do you predict will vote for either Hillary or, or Trump? And then people play with these, um, uh, with these sliders and they adjust, right? And the second question is, what do you think how other people uh, would respond to this question, right? And then when people start answering these two questions, you know, they, they come to think what other people think and start adjusting their own questions. So this is the Bayesian element, right? So you're, you're starting to uh, adjust what you said before simply because of you're, you're starting to take into account the, uh, uh, the opinion of others. That's what we want you to, uh, to think. Now, again, not everyone thinks this way. Not, not everyone basically is um, as good at estimating what other people think. So we need to have a methodology to figure out which people should be more trusted and we, which people should be less trusted. And that then comes the second part of the methodology and this is the network analysis, right? So I'll explain to you what this, what this is. Um, so this is essentially this really pretty graph with, with, uh, with nice colors. Um, this is a network of Croatian voters in the 2015, uh, sorry, elections. The first time we did this. Uh, so th this is 6,000 people in this, uh, in this survey. Um, they're all connected. So if you can see these little uh, uh, links between them, these are friendship links. Okay, so I can capture who is friends with who on Facebook um, or on Twitter, who's following whom. And the cir one circle is one individual. The color of the circle is the party. So who you're voting for. Croatia is a multi-party system. So you're voting for a lot of parties. And the size of the circle is how influential you are. So for example, this big circle in the middle is someone who's voting for the, for the social Democrats. And this person, uh, because of his share, so he was, Sorry, he was sharing the survey and a lot of he or she, right? We don't know who, but they were sharing the survey and a lot of people came into their, to the survey via their link. So this gives them a sort of a, a 
they're basically influential uh, for uh, for the survey, and they can basically influence a lot of opinions. This is important later for some of our commercial projects. But in terms of our predictions, I, I want you to take a look at this little yellow circle down in your in your uh, lower uh, right corner. So this yellow circle is an example of a typical bubble, right? So these are voters. In, in, in this in this case in Croatia, this was the GVZ party. So they were a kind of a populist party uh, back in that election. And you can notice that these voters of GVZ they tend to cluster together a lot. So they don't have a lot of friends outside their own social group, right? And we can see this because we can see how they're clustered and how they're voting and how all of their friends are voting. So the point is when these people come into the survey, when they give a prediction, they're gonna say, my party is gonna get 50% of, uh, of the vote, right? Usually their party gets you know, three to 5%. So what I know by this is that these guys are unrealistic. So I give them a very low weight in their prediction, right? So I, I don't value their opinion as much as I value other people's opinion, simply because they, they live in a bubble. This, uh, uh, if you look at the, the uh, lower right, uh, sorry, the, the, the lower red group is a, tip, is a bubble of social Democrat voters. This is the bubble of green voters. What I want are people in the upper, uh, upper part of the graph, so-called heterogeneous groups. Right? So some of your friends are left-wing, some of them are right-wing, some of them are centrist. This means that each person living here, so existing in these environments, has a higher probability of being right. It doesn't matter that they're actually right. It doesn't mean that they're, that they're actually right, uh, but they have a higher probability of being so. Right. So when we take everyone's predictions based on the, the, the answer of the questions that I've just shown you, and we basically pull them together in this, uh, in this wide network, we can see people that exist that live within certain bubbles, liberal bubbles, conservative bubbles, whatever. And we try to find uh, people that kind of exist between them that have a better, a higher probability of being right. And that's the whole approach. That's how it works, right? So we give each person a probability distribution and this probability distribution is essentially the weight of every person's uh, individual prediction. So that's how, that's how the whole thing works. Now, because of this, because we, we look for these clusterings and we're trying to find the best observer of an environment. So I want, you know, I want you, I'm going to give you a higher weight in the prediction. If you understand how the people around you uh, uh, think or, or what they do or what they see and what they don't see. And I can see this, I can see how well you're predicting other people based on what they're predicting as well. Um, so, so basically, because of this approach, there's we no we don't need necessarily uh, to have a representative sample in our surveys, right? Um, and and I, I'm making an explicit point about this because this is all done online, and typically surveys done online are not really representative of the whole population. They tend to be biased towards urban voters, uh, um, uh, higher educated oh. voters, whatever, um, or younger voters. So basically, what I want but with this is to say that we don't necessarily need a representative sample because we're getting, by asking you, we're getting an opinion about your entire community, right? So if I, if I did a poll, you guys, there's how many of you, 12, 13, whatever. If I did a poll um, by asking each and every one of you a certain question, I'm not just asking you, I'm asking you what your entire community thinks, right? So that's, that's a much larger group of people, which is why the standard way of doing polling, the representative sample way, which was very important in standard statistics, is no longer applicable in this type of methodology. Now, I'm emphasizing this because, you know, we all notice that there's this huge problem with polls that's been happening in the last basically decade, right? Yeah, but there is one point that I wanted to mention is that polls are not necessarily by themselves predictions. They're simply snapshots of voter attitudes over time, right? So you need, in, in order to figure out what the polls are saying, you always need to look at the trends, right? So if the polls are going, if the trends for a candidate are going up or down. But there's, there's two essential problems with the polling industry that, that have been prevalent ever since um, basically, well, you know, ever since the last five or six, maybe even 10 years. The first of all is, is a decline of the, uh, of the response rate. So right now in, in this election, the response rate is, it was down to only about 6%. So what does this mean? Uh, this is the number of people who, who are responding to your surveys when you're calling them. So back in the 90s or in the 80s, it was over 40%. You can see 97, it was about 36%. Right now, it was about 6%. This is according to Pew Research and Harvard Business Review. So this simply means that if you want, for example, a sample of, of 600 people, right, uh, back in 1997, you needed to call about 2,000 people to get 600, right? Today, you need to call 10,000 people to get the 600. 
So put it into perspective, right? If you're calling 2,000 people, let's say about half of them don't vote, right? So that's you know, half of your sample is gone right there. But in those 1,000 that do vote, you're getting 600, so you're getting a pretty good picture of of your uh, of the group that you wanna that you wanna sample, that you wanna ask a question to. But if you have if you if you get a sample of 600 and you need to call 10,000 people, and let's say again that 5,000 are not voting, but you're still left with a huge group of voters who are simply not responding, and you don't know what they're thinking, and you don't know how they're voting. So you you and you know you you basically you're going to have problems in in forming this representative sample and figuring out what the voters are. Uh, uh, what the voters are saying. Now, the polls are, are aware of this, obviously, and they're, they're trying to fix it with models. And what they did, for example, in 2020, they adjusted their models from 2016 to include low educated voters, but they made an even bigger error. I'll show you that later. So the error in 2016 was about 4%. The error in 2020 was about 6%. And now we, we're coming to the problem of sampling bias, right? And I, I've put down a little table here. This is from the New York Times. Um, they did a little experiment back in 2016 where they, they, they ran their own survey of 1,000 people in Florida. And they gave this raw data set of 1,000 responses to five different pollsters. And five different pollsters, if you can see that the, the table gave them five different results, right? Ranging from a Hillary uh, plus four to a Trump plus one victory, right? So we're talking about the same data set, but the, uh, the pollsters are adjusting them because each of them has a different model of adjusting their, uh, uh, adjusting the, uh, the responses they get from users. Now, this approach is wrong, obviously, because the, mod the models here are not anticipating events like Trump or like Brexit. And that's the problem with these models, right? And we don't need this because we, we're not running a standard model. We're not even running a standard uh, a survey. We're running a different type of survey, which is why it was enabled us to be much more precise. Now, let me show you the precision. So in 2016, uh, we predicted Trump. We were basically the, the only ones using a poll, using a poll to predict Trump. Um, and, and look at the look at the margins. So in Pennsylvania, it was uh, you know 48 to 46. The actual result was 49 to 47. Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, all these major states, we got it right. We missed Michigan and Wisconsin at the time simply because we didn't even poll them. Uh, we didn't have a lot of resources back then. We were just uh, running it through our own budget. So we only did these states, and we got all of them correctly, and, which enabled us to predict the Trump Trump outcome for Brexit. Similar thing for Brexit, uh, the base on our method estimated 51.3, the actual outcome was 51.9. So it was incredible precision within a single percentage point. And the same thing happened again this year. Uh, this was just to show you the calibration of the model, just to briefly explain it. Calibration means, um, so how close is your prediction to the 45 degree line, right? So this is our prediction. It's very close to the 40, the, the blue one is very close to the 45 degree line, whereas the orange, the orange prediction is the average of all the pollsters. And basically our, uh, our error was, you know, within a single percentage point, whereas the pollsters back then were un underestimating Trump by four percentage points. They were really, they were good for Hillary, but they were really, really underestimating Trump, which is why they, they made these mistakes, especially in Pennsylvania, uh, Florida, and North Carolina, the three most important states back, back then. We got some media attention back then uh, from our prediction, uh, and, and we, you know, raised the company based on that. Uh, and then we did it again in 2020. This time for paying clients, uh, mostly in the finance industry in the U.S. and, and in uh, in London. And basically, th these were the results. This is what we sent uh, on our last day to our clients, and we were really, really correct again in predicting uh, uh, several things. Right. First of all, the, the, there was not, not going to be any blue wave. So a lot of pollsters were saying you know, there's there's a certainty of a blue wave coming where Biden is going to take states like Texas, Florida, Ohio, whatever. That didn't happen. Uh, we were saying that Florida is definitely going to go for Trump plus Ohio, Texas, Iowa. And, the, and we again saw that the polls were underestimating Trump. However, we never saw at one point that Trump was flipping the, the upper free states, the north, north and western free states, so Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And we were correctly calling them, again, within a single percentage point of accuracy. And our estimate, again, is uh, the Electoral College is going to be about 20, 294 votes for Biden. So, so this was done before the final outcome. The final outcome is now 306, which was much more uh, accurate than all the other pollsters who were giving Biden anything between 350 and 340 to 350 electoral college votes. So again, incredible precision. This is just to show you the margins. Uh, so for the polling average um, for, for the pollsters was, you can see that the error was about four to five percent for these states, for Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Seven percent error 
in, in Florida and Ohio, for us, it was, it was much better. So for these four states, for Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Nevada, 1% error. For Florida and Ohio, it was slightly bigger, but still it went in the right direction, whereas others were uh, giving on the aggregate. If you, if, you, uh, if you look at the aggregates, they were giving both Florida and Ohio to, uh, to Biden, which, is, which didn't happen. So the interesting part here is that you know, we were sending this signal to our clients and to the people who bought our predictions, um, on Wednesday morning, when everything was, you know, people were thinking that Trump is going to win again, the odds were going in Trump's favor. And we had a bunch of clients um, who were actually betting on the outcome. So I sent an email early Wednesday morning saying that, uh, no, we're still certain that Biden is going to win, even though uh, Trump was uh, at the time winning uh, slightly ahead in, in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. But this is before the mail-in votes. We were saying we're quite confident that our prediction is going to come true which made a few of our clients double down on their bets, betting even more because the, 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 you know, the, the odds went slightly uh, in favor of Trump, meaning that you can win more if you bet on Biden. So we made our clients uh, quite a lot of money uh, with, these, with these predictions, which is always a good thing. Um, well, at least for them <laughs> and for us consequently, hopefully, right? Um, anyway, so this is to show you the calibration once again. Um, I don't know if you can see. Um, Okay, uh, so calibration. So you can basically see that once again, our model was within a single percentage point, whereas the polls this time about 6% error, uh, margin of error for the key, uh, for the most important states. So we're looking at only at about 15 states, uh, no, 12, sorry, 12 states at this point um, to show there, to show the, the precision. Um, once again, a comparison um, with the pollsters, you can see basically for some states how close we were to the actual outcome. Whereas this is compared to to, uh, to the polls, this is the difference between Trump and Biden, and this is the actual Trump prediction. Once again, you can see. So look at the scattering of Trump predictions. Again, a huge underestimation for Trump uh, by the polls in in almost every single state, essentially. Right. This is what we what we noticed once again happening. Um, we were also, as I mentioned, anticipating contested elections. So we were saying we were adamant in our report. We were saying that uh, the election outcome is not going to be known on November third. It's going to be obvious maybe next the week after it was it was obvious in the end on saturday but we knew it was, it was going to take a lot a, 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 a bit of a you know a higher a longer period of figuring out the results simply because pennsylvania and some other states were counting votes later because of uh, various court decisions so and, and we saw this again with with, uh, with our respondents so 64 percent of them were expecting a contested election so the election not to be known on election night um, again, and this is to show you basically that, our, that, our, that we didn't need the representative sample. So notice that our sample, just so this is just the, the voters, right, uh, that, that we had in the survey, just the use that we had in the survey. We got 52% of them voting for Biden, 40% voting for Trump. We had the same thing in 2016. We had about uh, um, 50, even more, we had about 55% Hillary voters and only about 40% um, uh, percent of Trump voters, but it's still... Uh, it was enough for us to to, uh, uh, to get the right idea of who wins, simply because this is it's not about who you're going to vote for; it's about what you think other people are going to do. That's the whole point, right? That's why the representativeness of the sample was not necessary at this point. Um, other parts, in terms of you know age, gender, and party affiliation, this was all in the expected direction. I, I just wanted to show you this thing. Um, so we noticed that a lot of people uh, in the Biden camp, so who voted Democrat back in 2016, were uh, so 97 percent of them went for Biden, only two percent defected back to Trump. Uh, whereas Trump voters in, uh, in 2016, only 85% of them stayed for Trump, whereas 11% went for Biden. This simply means that um, both of these candidates benefited significantly from increased turnout, which we, which we noticed uh, Biden ended up with about 80 million voters. Trump, I think, is going to end up with 74, 75 million, uh, which is historic for, you know, uh, for both of them and bigger, uh, higher than any president in history. Uh, again, due to the, uh, as a consequence of the whole COVID pandemic. But it's interesting that this increased turnout was in the end uh, uh, crucial for uh, uh, Biden's uh, significantly stronger performance, but also for Trump not losing uh, as many voters as, as it might have been uh, um, um, you know, inferred from basically this, this outcome. And finally, I just wanted to show you the comparison of uh, other others' predictions. Uh, so we were comparing ourselves to um, a bunch of, um, let's say, uh, benchmarks. 
Um, so the polling aggregation sites like 538 to Nate Silver or the RCP average of poor, uh, polls or Princeton's electoral consortium, et cetera, on the average, they were giving about 340, as I mentioned, uh, electoral college vote, 90% chances for Biden. Um, this time, you know, again, all of them got it right, but um, in, in the essence, only the betting odds were slightly uh, let's say, uh, less skewed towards, towards uh, uh, um, uh, a strong Biden victory uh, than the rest of them. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this, this is it. So uh, essentially, uh, we were more precise than, than any of these considering the, the um, overall outcome, considering the individual states. Um, and yeah, we got, the, we got the right outcome again for the third time in, in a big election. And now we're waiting for it to, um, to deliver more results as it did the first time. Okay, thank you very much. I'll uh, I'll stop sharing right now so that you, we can we can open the floor for uh, for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, one or two questions myself. Sure. The first one would be, uh, in your opinion, what was the greatest advantage of your models over the rest of the models? Was it social media approach bubbles? What was the main reason? And second one, second question would be, how are you doing with prediction of uh, where the market is going to go? <laughs> Excellent questions. Right, so, so in terms of the advantage, I would think, yeah, the social network element, definitely. So when we usually, so when we did the wisdom of crowd, so we, we always test a few to see what works better and what doesn't. Um, so back in 2016, for both Brexit and Trump, we, we wanted to see just what the wisdom of crowds approach does on its own. And it wouldn't be enough to call Brexit or, or Trump, right? Today, it, it would be enough for Biden, but it wouldn't be enough back in 2016. So really, it was the network analysis approach that delivered the crucial difference, right? That's So the network part delivers precision. The, the wisdom of crowds can get the right trend. That's so, so, so to speak, uh, but uh, the network uh, analysis pushes you to the right outcome and with, with a very, uh, very small, very, very good margin, essentially. Um, so yeah, because, because it uncovers these bubbles, right? So I can see which people are more or less likely to be right in their predictions, and that, that's, that's very helpful. In terms of market predictions, this is something that I wanted to do ever since 2016, essentially, ever since the first time we did this, did this successfully. Yeah, but it's a bit harder because, so with markets, so with, with elections, it's easier because if I ask all of you, for example, all of your voters, right? So you have an idea of, you know, you talk about other about politics with other people. So you have this idea about what other people are gonna do. But if you're not traders, then you're not gonna be able to tell me, you know, a lot about the market. So in order to make a market prediction, I can't just go to Facebook randomly and poll people. I need to go to a group of traders, a group of people who are on the markets and who are you know, thinking about markets, thinking about what other people are doing and ask their opinion. Now, I wanted to do this and as of now, so we, since we had uh, a few clients which were in the finance industry, now we're hoping to basically build this, uh, this app for uh, market predictions and it needs to be tested first on traders. So we, we'll try to do this. We'll, we're definitely pushing in that direction. Uh, we have a question from uh, Emil Mesich, and he says, uh, uh -huh. what are some, some of the current Hi, projects? The okay. oh. sure. So, uh, yeah, we, we typically do, so elections are not um, our main source of income, so to speak. What we mostly do is either two things, either data science projects, or um, a market research project. So in market research, it's figuring out in, using the same methodology, uh, what people are gonna do, right? So are they gonna buy a certain product? How are they gonna react to a certain message, to a certain response? Um, are they gonna, you know, which channel, which communication channel works best for which group of people? So a lot of profiling and, and figuring these things out. We worked with the clients in a lot of industries. We did, um, um, sorry, FMCG. So, so things like cosmetics and foods and beverages. Uh, the beer industry, for example, we did, uh, Uber was one of our first big clients when they came to, to Croatia and to the region. And for them, for example, we did this great project about figuring out what does it take to become an Uber driver. So they need to recruit new drivers and we need to figure out what is the best motivation for someone to become a driver. What are people's fears? What are people's, uh, why, why they don't want to become, why they do want to become. And, you know, this helped them frame the message and basically uh, um, uh, increase their recruitment, uh, uh, increase the success of their recruitment. Um, we did a lot for retail as well, uh, for banking even, but so this is mostly like market research products, whereas the data science pro projects, they're mostly, most, mostly thus far based on retail and logistics and figuring out, uh, you know, optimization of supply chains, for example, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, let me just see if there's another. Ah, right, sorry. Yeah, COVID. That was also, I forgot to mention, I saw Emily asking another question, right? Uh, have you done any research whether people will be taking the COVID vaccine? So no, not on the vaccine specifically, but we did a big research in April. So we did, we had a client that commissioned a survey uh, across the EU in April and in June. So we did two surveys. Uh, we, we were asking people what they're, how they're going to react to COVID, how they're going to react to the lockdown. This is very important to figure out in, the, in early April which is when we did the survey. And the question was, uh, are people, are we gonna have, you know, a, a swift V-shaped recovery, which a lot of people thought at the time it was gonna be the case, or is it gonna be a more prolonged situation, a more prolonged recovery? And we, we figured out that people are, um, you know, they're gonna change their behavior, right? So they're not gonna go out as quickly as, as some people assumed. Uh, they're gonna lower spending, uh, stay more indoors, um, not go out to their favorite places as they once did. So we've been basically noticed, and this was this was shown in the Google Mobility data, that after the lockdowns were, were lifted, after the restrictions, the movement restrictions were lifted, people didn't come back to work or come back to their favorite restaurants immediately, right? So it took a, a, you know, a gradual ad adaptation, especially for restaurants. So for example, uh, if, if you look at across Europe, uh, restaurants uh, only recovered only about you know 50 or 60 percent people of people came back and and this took a while it took about a few months for, for that to uh, to regress to that level in terms of workplaces it only recovered to about 70 to 80 percent again depending on which country and this is something that we saw in the data initially in April uh, and basically made our, our predictions that um, it's not going to be a, a v-shaped recovery it's, it's it's more likely to be a very prolonged recovery in terms of the vaccine you know, we, we didn't ask this question but we did ask um, people's opinions on COVID and, and noticed that about you know 30 percent even then right in April thought that it was it was fake and then you know but, but about you know 60 to almost 70 percent uh, took it seriously and we're going to change their behavior as, as a consequence. Nice. Uh, no other question? I'm going to ask another question and please uh, I'm asking others to ask a question. Oh here we go from Dom Stefan. Should you have a question? Can read it? Okay, so what volume, volume of data is collected during U.S. election to use a neutral network model? Um, so in terms of volume, so for this election, it was about 2,000 people, um, which was more than enough. Again, this is the, the, the beauty of the whole network approach when we, when we basically um, uh, so, so ask one person and then get an idea of what the entire community thinks. Um, in terms of the new, neural network, no, we don't use neural networks. Um, so it's just, so what we use, we, we're looking at things like closeness and centrality. So how close you are to certain friends and uh, how associated you are with them and whether or not this gives you a higher or a lower likelihood of, of being in a bubble. So the, the picture that I showed you is the best way to, to see this, right? So you can see if people are, you know, clustered in, in, in one group or, or, or around a certain opinion or if they're scattered around. And this is how we basically uh, figure out whether or not you are uh, um, in the bubble. So it's, it's not a neural network, no. Okay. Uh, until somebody asked uh, another question, perhaps you could step outside of big data uh -huh. topic and tell us as a political economist, sure. uh, what in your opinion is the, the, the main reason of the fact that uh, uh, Trump lost the election? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, well, mm -hmm. sure. So, so I can tell you, right, in, in terms of, let's start with why he won in 2016. So if you, if you look at the, the trends, right, um, of, of how the voters, or which types of voters and where Trump is winning, there's a huge urban-rural divide in the United States, right? It's huge, immense, right? If you go to every single state, whether it's a red state or a blue state, you're going to see that the bigger cities are blue, they're Democrat, and the smaller cities, the towns are red. They're, they're Republican. And there's this disconnect here that people simply in these two environments don't understand each other, right? It's people in smaller communities don't understand people from big city, people coming from big cities. People in the big cities are not understanding people in the smaller communities. And there's this problem in the American community that is essentially, you know, dying out. There's this great book about, uh, from um, uh, Case and Deaton. Uh, uh, Deaton was a Nobel Prize winner in economics. It's called Debts of Despair, when they're noticing that there's a huge, there's, there's this increase of debts for middle-aged Americans, especially white, non-Hispanic whites, uh, and, and uh, they're dying from um, uh, diseases, uh, not, not from diseases, sorry, from uh, uh, despair, essentially. These are conditions like uh, uh, suicide or drug, or drug abuse, 
opi opioids, mainly not like cocaine or things like that, uh, and alcohol poisoning, right? And so these communities, you know, they're losing a lot of jobs because of technology, because of uh, uh, globalization, and um, people are dying out. And there's a, there's this let's let's call it a type of feeling that they're being left out. There's this depression going around and uh, people want something new they want to they want to change and trump was this agent of change right so trump is a consequence of this type of feeling in the american community which is essentially dying out especially the whites um so so and this is what happened in 2016 and the reason and, and if you notice trump actually increased his voter shares so he got 62 million votes back in 2016 now he got 74 75 million so there's a huge increase Voters again, because a lot of voters still see him as this um, as this element of change of someone who's going to kick it to the elites, which is an interesting observation. The reason why he lost, I would I would say, it was because of COVID. Right? Um, had it not been for COVID, uh, I was what we what we were looking at back in early January, so before the whole COVID pandemic, we were seeing that Trump was going to you know destroy the election. Right? So uh, in terms of you know, defeating Democrats significantly, because we were looking at these. Uh, things what the campaigns were doing and the Biden campaign was not focusing on digital at all. They were focusing on TV ads, whereas the Trump campaign was going very strongly on, on messaging, uh, messages on messenger platforms like WhatsApp. Um, and they were doing really well there uh, and mobilizing their voters. So, you know, had it not been for, for the COVID pandemic and the huge mobilization of mail-in voters by the Democrats done this way, I think that Trump would have, would have won. I mean, this is my opinion, but I, I think it, it, it definitely could have, could have happened. Okay, there's another question. Uh, sure. Have there been any studies into the belief that the European Union will continue on its course into the foreseeable future? Uh -huh. Is there any anti-EU sentiment? Well, yeah, it depends on country, from country to country. Actually, interestingly, um, what we notice is that after Brexit, um, across the EU, in many countries, um, there, was, uh, there was an increase in pro-European sentiment, right? Because people saw the whole... Uh, thing after Brexit as being quite shambolic, and it was it was a process that was um, well, you know, it, it was it was a very painful, long process, and it kind of increased uh, uh, the belief of certain people in the EU uh, across the across the European Union, which was an interesting effect because everyone was expecting the opposite, right? So if Britain exits, we were thinking you know other countries are going to follow suit, but it didn't happen. It's not happening yet. Again, now given that this crisis is now occurring uh, and there's definitely going to be an economic crisis coming out of this we will see how this affects europe because because last time this happened the europe the euro almost crumbled in, its, in itself and the european union was basically left uh, you know very fractured and fragile um brexit sort of consolidated some part of it i mean britain is out obviously but the rest of europe uh, uh, is, uh, is a bit more consolidated than it was before, but well, not counting for Poland and, and Hungary, um, where there is an increase in anti-EU sentiment, but in, in main, most other countries, there's an, actually an increase in pro-EU sentiment, which is an interesting uh, interesting factor. Okay, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your company, a little more like how many people are employees. It was uh, cool. established 2016, 17, I think, right? S 16, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's uh, located in the UK, right? Yeah, it's, it's located in Cambridge in, in the UK. And we have, so there's three of us that are founders and we have 10 people working for us, mostly on a part-time zero hour basis. Um, these are mostly web developers and data scientists. And we have a few interns, free interns. Uh, so it's, it's a small company and we're mostly, uh, we're mostly doing projects on a, like on a consulting uh, uh, basis. So it's project by project basis uh, I'm, I'm still trying to build uh, a product that can be sell, sold as a, as a, on a subscription base so that i can make a uh, make the company more scalable and i can make the the, you know, the revenues more predictable but not for now it's it's a kind of a consulting based approach okay great and uh who are your main clients and who's doing uh, calling for you who's doing what who's making calls for you you have to contact two thousand people right when you're making uh, ah, right right yeah 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 no so we do the uh, so, so so clients are mostly as I, as I mentioned um so in in retail banking uh fast moving consumer goods like uh foods and beverages and and cosmetics um and the, we're not doing calling so we're not calling people on phones we are uh using facebook ads and social media ads to get to people right so um 
the, the way this works, we typically launch an ad on Facebook saying, or Twitter or wherever, saying, you know, do you want to predict an election? You win a hundred euros, for example, or a hundred dollars, right? Okay. Um, um, and then, you know, this is, this is the attraction that people have. And then they see the ad, they click on the ad, solve the survey, right? Solve a survey, win, win some money. This is for elections, for other surveys, it's just that, that's the message, right? So solve a survey about, you know, cosmetics, whatever, um, about your shopping patterns, about whatever. So we did, we did it also for, um, like uh, a betting company, and then we did it for um, um, uh, a fintech company launching in a new country. So the, this, this is a type of project that we do, um, and we uh, and so we uh, uh, we get people f- organically. Kind of the main approach. We also use agencies, so panel agencies. So you pay an agency, you get two thousand people, for example. Um, you pay about a euro, two euros per person. Um, but this has been—I mean, a lot of these people are simply just walking through the survey very quickly. So that's why I'm, I'm focusing on organic users, which are more likely to, you know, stop and think about the questions. So remember what I showed you initially—that the questions are deliberately, uh, uh, you know, convoluted and, and and a bit complicated. This is because we want people to think about them when they're solving. If you just want to walk through, that's fine. You can just walk through, but then your opinion is not going to be valued as someone who you know took the time to uh, to answer them so because we're, we're also we have a time stamp so we can see how long people are solving the survey uh, i have a question here do you use the oracle database no we don't we are uh, talking with oracle about a collaboration but we're not using their databases as of now okay any more questions uh huh? somebody's calling here Uh, It's Michael Yelovich here, Toronto. Are you taking voice? I'm on phone. Are you taking voice uh, questions? Yeah, sure. If I can remember it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, There are data aggregators and uh, that uh, aggregate data, uh, for instance, Axiom, and uh, they go through social networking, every possible data point that they can assemble, and then somehow um, they aggregate them and they identify people through little bits of information. And essentially, uh, individuals are um, are offering up information about the way they think, and you have an ability to maybe think, to, uh, analyze the way they think subconsciously as well as consciously. Are you using um, giant uh, data sets uh, produced by companies like Axiom uh, to uh, access uh, raw data to be able to analyze uh, possible behavior? Mm-hmm. No, so th- that's kind of the, the point of our approach. We, we that's why we use our app because we want to have every user come through our app uh, because there's a specific way of, we're, of how we're asking these questions and how we're following our users in, in the way that they're answering the questions. So it really needs to be users coming through our app in order to, in order to give the answers. So we, we're not using these uh, uh, big data sets and data, data aggregators. Um, we want to get to people organically. I mean, there is a problem with um, Facebook and Twitter. They're making it increasingly more difficult of, of, of doing this which is why we should think about um, approaches like, like these ones, and we, we definitely will, um, because I think in the long run, well, not even in the long run, in the next five years, Facebook is going to become um, uh, more and more problematic for us in getting people in through Facebook. Uh, so we're either going to have to build our own uh, little network of, of users, uh, like a panel, or you know, switch to something like, like what you mentioned. Well, somebody else comes up with a question: Do you, Are you splitting your time between UK and Croatia? Or typically, I am. Yeah, but ever since ever since COVID, no, right? And I'm here with the family, with the wife and kids. But usually, yeah, before March, I was in the UK almost every week in London, um, talking with clients. Most of our clients are, are you know, in the UK and Europe. Not a lot of them in Croatia. Uh, but I live here, so I, I kind of have the situation where I live in Croatia and work abroad, which is which is the best possible combination because living in Croatia is actually not that bad if That's you true. can work abroad. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, is there any questions? Any more questions, gentlemen, ladies? I guess we um, we asked what we had to ask. So uh, at this point, I, I, hope, I hope it was it was interesting and amusing enough for, for everyone. I think Thanks it was very interesting. And you know how to keep people's attention. Your, your, cool. your delivery is excellent. So thank you so thank much you. for this wonderful presentation. And we hope to see you one day in Canada um, speaking at the faculty of uh, of a faculty club of U of T for us. And in the meantime, Toronto. yeah, absolutely. Our coordinates coordinates overlap. We can. I, I, I'll, I'll I, I was only I was only in Canada once. I was in Montreal. So next time I. Uh-huh.
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So as I was saying, I was only in Canada and Montreal. I haven't been to Toronto, so I have to come to Toronto then. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be more than happy to see you. Uh, cool. Vucha, thank you so much thank for you. this. Oh, wait a second. Oh, there's a thank you for you, uh, for uh, Dubrav Kovarac. Uh, once again, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Looking forward to, to seeing you again. It was a pleasure. Bye, okay. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Recorded? Still recording. Excellent. Okay, I hope uh, everybody had a good time. People left, some people left. Yeah. Okay. That was so good. By, uh... Anyways, thank you everybody uh, so much for joining us. And uh, in two weeks from now, we're going to have uh, Davor Pavuna. Great. Okay, guys. Okay, Bye. Google and Dickens. Bye-bye.